think in a former life, I might have been a moth. Bear with me. Because they are irresistibly drawn to light, and I'm a bit the same. But not any old light, this light. Isn't it beautiful? Is it just me? <laughs> this light is being made by trillions of living bacteria, and it's called bioluminescence, literally a living light. Now, this bacteria I isolated from a piece of fish from the supermarket, but don't worry, it's not dangerous. And it's not just bacteria in the sea that glow either. There's a soil bacterium called Photorhabdus luminescens, uh, and it forms a rather amazing partnership with a tiny parasitic worm called a nematode. Now, the nematode houses the bacteria in its gut and has a very nasty habit of burrowing its way into the larvae of various insects. Once inside the insect, the worm vomits up the bacteria which starts to produce toxins, which kill the larvae. Now, this decaying corpse is a great supply of nutrients for those bacteria as they're reproducing. So it's such a great supply of nutrients that the bacteria also produces antibiotics to stop other bacteria from taking advantage of the situation. Now, for some reason, the bacteria also starts to glow in the dark. And what it does is it lights up that little corpse, like an eerie Christmas tree decoration. Now, it's thought that this might attract other insects, um, essentially giving the, the, them a pool of new victims, I guess, to, to attack. So what happens is the, um, the nematodes reproduce, and then they spill out of this little corpse, looking for their next victim, and the cycle repeats. Now, there's an interesting footnote here that in the American Civil War, there were reports of soldiers who developed glowing wounds. And if they had glowing wounds, they were much more likely to survive their injuries. Now, they called it angel's glow, which is kind of beautiful, but there's nothing supernatural about it. So what's much more likely is that those soldiers had uh, wounds contaminated with photorhabdus from the surrounding soil. The antibiotics produced by Photorhabdus would have stopped other nastier bacteria from taking hold and causing horrible infections like gangrene and um, blood poisoning. So Photorhabdus glows um, because they have genes for producing light using a really simple chemical reaction. Now, the chemicals are called luciferin and luciferase. And if you put luciferin and luciferase together in the presence of oxygen, you get light. Now, nearly 25 years ago, scientists discovered the genes that Photorhabdus uses to produce luciferin and luciferase, allowing scientists like me to exploit bioluminescence for science. Very exciting. Okay, so I'm a microbiologist, and I am fascinated by how some viruses and bacteria can kill a healthy person, sometimes in just a few days. Take this one. You might recognize this one. This is Ebola. I'll tell you a secret. This is the microbe that got me hooked on microbiology in the first place because it's both amazing and utterly terrifying. I was a teenager when I first read about Ebola, and all I could think of was, how does it turn the human body into a virus-producing factory? Ugh, amazing. But this is not a talk about Ebola, and I'm going to tell you why. Because Ebola is like the great white shark of the microbial world. It's the one that gets quite a lot of the press. So who here has heard of tuberculosis? A few hands, okay. So it's uh, also known as TB, um, a lung disease that we thought we'd eradicated 50 years ago. Well, we were very wrong. So it turns out that more people die every week from tuberculosis than have died so far ever from Ebola. Just think about that. Okay, but you might be thinking, what have all these viruses and bacteria got to do with us here in New Zealand? Did you know that one out of every four people who are admitted to a hospital overnight in New Zealand are there because of an infectious microbe? It's the equivalent of over 85,000 Kiwis 
every year. Our rates of some infectious diseases are higher than countries like the UK and Australia, and they're rising. Now, it's not supposed to be this way. As countries get richer, they're supposed to get less infectious diseases. The rates are supposed to go down. And they're supposed to see more cases of things that we call non-communicable diseases, things like cancer and heart disease. And this is partly what's happened in New Zealand over the last 20 years. So if we look at the data on why people are admitted to hospital, we can see that the number of people there because of a non-communicable disease have gone up by 7% in the last 20 years. And this is what we would expect. But the number there because of an infectious disease haven't gone down. They've also gone up by 50%. Now I'm going to tell you another thing that's slightly more terrifying, I think. We are running out of medicines to treat these infections. In 2014, the World Health Organization reported that antibiotic-resistant superbugs are present in every region of the world, including here in New Zealand. Experts predict that within the next 10 years, things like cancer chemotherapy and routine surgery will become life-threateningly risky. And something as simple as a stub toe or a cut finger could be deadly. That's frightening. So what has all of this got to do with photorabdus luminescence and angel's glow? Well, at my lab at the University of Auckland, we take bacteria like the ones that cause TB and the ones that cause food poisoning and nasty skin infections, and we give them the genes that photorabdus uses to produce light. In other words, we make nasty bacteria glow in the dark. It's a job someone's got to do. It's me. <laughs> so um, one of the reasons is that instead of having to wait for our bacteria to grow on petri dishes, which can take weeks or even months for some of them, we can just see how many there are using light. Basically, the more bacteria there are, the brighter the light. One of the most amazing uses of our glowing bacteria is to understand how they cause disease in laboratory animals like mice. Now, the traditional way that this would be done would be to take a group of animals, usually a large group, to give them an infection, and then to euthanize small numbers of them at different time points, take out the organs where you think the bacteria are, put them onto petri dishes, wait for the bacteria to grow. Or you could wait for the animals to show you the signs of disease. But that was the old-fashioned way. One of the most amazing things about light is that it travels through flesh and skin. You can see this if you put your hand over the top of a torch, right? Now, we use our bacteria like mini torches. We put them inside of animals, and then we use sensitive cameras to see where they are, how many there are, and how that changes over time, all without having to euthanize the animals. What this means is that we use a lot fewer animals in our experiments, and we don't have to wait for them to show any of the signs of infection. As well as being able to do our experiments more humanely using fewer animals, we also have the amazing ability to see what our bacteria are doing in a living animal in real time. So one of the bacteria that I'm really interested in is called Streptococcus pyogenes. Has anybody heard of it? It causes... Um, probably most famously, this incredible infection called necrotizing fasciitis, or the flesh-eating disease. Because sometimes this microbe can produce an enzyme that digests flesh and muscle. Now, it also causes rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease in some people. But actually, pretty much everyone in this room will have had a strep pyogenes infection at some point in their lives, because it also causes tonsillitis. In fact, some of you will have this bacterium in your throats at this very moment. <laughs> You'll be fine, don't worry. So we were doing an experiment where we were, or a study, where we were interested in what um, strep pyogenes does in the noses and throats of mice. And this is really important for studying new vaccines and new antibiotics. So we were using a glowing strep that we'd made, and one day my student Faz came and he showed me some pictures he'd been taking. Now, there was a mouse with a glowing nose, as we'd expect, but what we weren't expecting was it to have a glowing vagina. 
Well, so it turns out that strep pyogenes likes to live in the mucous membranes of our throat. But our throat isn't the only bit of our body that has mucous membranes. So do our genitals. <laughs> so we shouldn't have been surprised at all that this very versatile bug could go on and colonize this mouse's vagina. But we would never have seen it if we hadn't been for our growing bacteria. Another amazing thing about our growing bacteria is that they'll only glow when they're alive because the chemical reaction requires energy. So if the bacteria are killed, the lights go out. This means that bioluminescence is a really, really quick way of finding out whether drugs and antibiotics work. All we do is we take our growing bacteria and our experimental medicines, we put them together, and then we look for light. And we can get an answer very, very quickly, within hours or minutes. We don't have to wait for the bacteria to grow on petri dishes. One of the projects that I guess I'm most excited about at the moment is searching New Zealand's native fungi for new antibiotics. So penicillin, the first antibiotic ever discovered, comes from a fungus. New Zealand has native fungi found nowhere else in the world. So who knows what we will discover? Very exciting. Anyway, it's not just about the search for antibiotics. We're also very interested in what our bacteria are actually doing. One of the amazing things about bacteria is that they can change their genetic material really, really, really quickly, way more quickly than we can. They can mutate their genes, they can rearrange them, they can even pick up new genes from their surroundings. Now, this is how we get antibiotic resistance, but it's also how we get new diseases seeming to pop up out of nowhere. Now, a few years ago, Germany was in absolute turmoil. They were having a case of food poisoning, um, and it was a really weird strain of E. coli with a, with, um, a very high rate of kidney failure. Now, over a two-month period, nearly 4,000 people were affected, and over 50 people died, all while officials were trying to find the source of the outbreak. Was it cucumbers? Was it lettuce? It turned out to be bean sprouts. Very dangerous bean sprouts. What had happened was, at some point in the past, a strain of E. coli met up with a related strain of E. coli, took hold of its toxin gene, and managed to uh, contaminate a consignment of bean sprout seeds. This was all in North Africa. Uh, con uh, contaminated a consignment of bean sprout seeds destined for Europe. What I'm really interested in is, how did that happen? I mean, not the contamination bit. Well, obviously, we want to know how that happened too. But how did this bug come about? How did it evolve? And this is one of the things that we're really interested in studying with our growing bacteria. Now, we're not going to do it using something that infects humans. That would be silly. Instead, we are using a bacterium that gives mice food poisoning in a very similar way to the um, E. coli's give uh, humans food poisoning. Now, you might be wondering what glowing food poisoning looks like in a mouse. I don't know. Well, I'm going to show you. Um, they make glowing poo. There you go. Now, we have this, I mean, we're really interested in this bug. So what is it going to do if we, if we evolve it? Is it going to become more dangerous or less? Is it become, become more infectious or less? And so this is what we've been doing. Now, we've got this very neat technique where we can basically let our mice um, infect each other. We don't give them a fake infection. We just let them do their thing. And we collect the bacteria and pop them in the freezer, storing the bacteria in the freezer so that we've got the bacterial equivalent of a fossil record. And the very exciting news is, I'm not quite sure how excited you'll be by, by this, but the very exciting news is that we have evolved a strain that is more infectious than before. And now the fun starts, because now we've got to figure out what's happened, what's changed, what genes has it changed, or has it picked up something new? How has this happened? So that's what we're doing, and hopefully we'll have some results from that very soon. We are in a battle with foes that can evolve much faster than we can, which is terrifying. And we're running out of medicines to treat them. We're hoping that photorabdus luminescence will help us understand how these E. coli's evolve and help us find new, uh, like a treasure trove of new antibiotics right here in New Zealand. We're hoping that bioluminescence will literally help us see the light. Thank you very much. <laughs>